This is CX of M Radio, the voice of customer experience professionals. Hello and welcome to another World of UX podcast. This is your host, Darren Hood. Thanks everybody for taking the time to join us on today. And a special welcome as always to those listening for the first time. Well, it's anniversary time. We are celebrating the fourth anniversary of the World of UX podcast all this month. And I'm going to have a special announcement. Should be at the end of this month. This is the first podcast for the month of May in 2024, but we will have a special announcement later on. I'm going to save that for later. Uh, there's going to be some special sessions that we are planning to share with you this month. Going to have some interviews, going to have some fireside chats some talking shop sessions, uh, but just some good stuff to celebrate the fourth year of speaking to the UX community at large about all things related to user experience. So again, thanks to everybody for taking the time to join us. Thanks for helping to, to share with us by giving of your time to listen to the podcast. We are celebrating Having been heard in over 100 countries, that's right, this podcast has been heard in over 100 countries as of this date. Uh, We have had, uh, for for a podcast like this, for it to have roughly approximately 90,000 downloads over those four years, it's a pretty hefty number. And so we're, we're happy about that. We're glad to have been able to share there. And we hope to continue bringing this content to you for a very long time. At any rate, to start off the anniversary celebration, a a month-long celebration, we're going to continue. We did a potpourri last week. We're going to have another potpourri session today. And for those of you listening for the first time, you could think of the UX potpourri sessions. I mean, it is what it is. We we know what potpourri is. It's a bunch of um, a mishmash of a whole lot of different elements all put together into one bag, if you will, into one pot. And think of it as a bunch of many recordings think of it as a bunch of many topics so instead of doing what we might normally do and just talk about one topic throughout one entire episode we're going to share in this episode we're going to share four we're going to look at four different topics over the course of this session so why don't we just go ahead and dive right in topic number one for this potpourri session For this session, the first topic we're going to be talking about is we want to talk about UX history. And more specifically, we want to talk about the importance of knowing UX history. There is, in this 20 some odd years, just a little over that actually, that UX has been on the radar in the business world. And please know and understand, I know. I don't want anybody reaching out to me saying UX hasn't been around for 20 years. It wasn't called UX 20 years ago. It's, it's been called other things. It's been called information architecture. What people did back then is information architecture. Today we call it UX and information architecture is a subset. Remember talking about what we called it. The there's when it first started out, some people tried to call it experience design that didn't take that's, we're coming full circle to that. And there are people today who call UX experience design. There's people who have that in their title. There are pe- people who think of UX as UCD, which is an acronym that's short for user centered design. There, there's different terminology, usability, which is now a subset of UX. Some people looked at that and thought of that. Uh, usability as being what we now call UX. And and so when we say UX now, we're simply calling it what it was called in the past. It's just what we're referring to it as. And I'm not going to get caught up in the the semantics debates, uh, especially when most of the people who debate about the semantics of UX are people who don't know the history, interestingly. So how about we just take a look at the history and A lot of times when I deliver a talk, probably half of my talks, I do spend time talking about a snapshot of UX history and trying to, even if people just understand the snapshot, 
if they just understand UX history from a very basic and rudimentary perspective, that's still light years beyond what people are recognizing today. And the problem of being ignorant about UX history, of not knowing about UX history, is that those people tend to believe a lot of really strange misdirective things. For example, I had somebody once, not too long ago, and I was dialoguing with this person on social media. Yeah, I do a lot of dialoguing with people on social media. Not exactly my favorite thing to do because it's often very, uh, it's jaded. And a lot of times when we talk about UX history with certain people, or just UX, I should say, with certain people, those people don't have the same knowledge. And it's very difficult to have an actual conversation with someone about UX when their knowledge about the discipline itself, whether it's history or it's practice, it's fundamentals, whatever it is, when people don't know about those things, they tend to talk from their perspective only. When you know the history of UX, it puts you in a better position to talk about UX from a very holistic perspective. If you don't know the history, I've seen people, when they don't know the history of UX, and you share with them things that are associated with the history of UX, if they are not a critical thinker, a lot of the people who are very subjective, they limit their perception to their own subjectivism. And this is where the problems come into place and, and, or into play. And, and it's really sad. I, I was talking to somebody, I'll go back to the other one in a moment. Someone recently said, you know, UX is really fuzzy. Mm, no, it's not. <laughs> UX isn't fuzzy. It's, it's not well defined. Uh, UX is defined. You, you see what I'm getting at here? There, when people don't know, then they ascribe limits. And when they ascribe limits, if you talk to them outside the boundaries of those limits, then they have a very difficult time believing, embracing, and ascribing value to what you're saying. So for anybody out there, if you don't know the history of UX, if you don't know anything about it, and again, I'm about to give you a snapshot, then you need to make sure you know these things and take the things I'm going to mention to you here and then go and dig into it a little bit more. You'll find some things out that are very interesting and it helps us to understand and it keeps you from being victimized by the predatory and opportunistic folks that are out there today and the people that try to sell you on their being experts when really they've only been doing the work for two or three years. They're entry-level people at best, even if that. Some people who, who have, are claiming to be experts and even some people who say they're entry-level, they, they, they haven't really scratched the surface yet of what's going on. UX is a lot bigger than people think that it is. Now, that other example I said I was going to come back to is where somebody said that UX has only been important for the last 10 years. That's a person that knows nothing about UX history. That, that's the way they talk. Those kinds of people, uh, and this person in particular, they think that UX has only been important for the last 10 years. Then they only date the importance of UX back to 2014, 2013 at the most. And the funny thing about that is the boot camps were launched in 2011, the UX boot camps, not the, not the, engineering of the developer boot camps those went off since before that and that's a different animal altogether the personas everything about it is different but ux boot camps only came along in 2011 but let's go back i don't i don't because if i get there i'll take my soapbox off about that and i don't want to do that so let's go back back in looking at again high level history for ux history the high level point of UX history goes back to the mid 1990s, around about 1995 or so, not too long before that. Now, mind you, pause for the cause here. There were some operations, there were some instances of what we now know as UX that were actually operating before the mid 1990s. It was very, on a very small scale, such a small scale that you simply didn't probably see very many jobs being posted about it at all to the point where we don't even talk about it. I only know one person. I'm a BIPOC practitioner. I'm a person of color. The, I only know one person who was BIPOC who was practicing UX prior to me. 
And that person was doing work at Apple in the late 80s. That person has been on this show before. Now, in the mid 90s, roughly from 93 to 95, Don Norman was working for Apple. He was the first person to have UX in their job title. He he foresaw it and was doing it then. He's he's coming against the term user now, but that that's another story. We talk about that another time. But he was doing the work. He was doing what we now call UX for Apple in roughly the mid 90s or so. When you fast forward a few years beyond that, when the Polar Bear book was written, what many of us call the Polar Bear book, which is a book about information architecture, that book was written in the about 97, 98 or so. Now, right along in that span of time, the internet became a thing. And this is what helped vault UX to the forefront. And it wasn't just this thing that a handful of people were doing, human factors, which is now part of what we call UX. It's a separate discipline all by itself. Because there are people that do human factors work that don't do UX at all. And then there's aspects of human factors work that are a part of UX. So important to know that. But at any rate, when the internet came along, when the internet that the public had access to, because the internet preceded that even, but when the, when the Best Buy came out and people started running and buying those first 25 megabyte hard drives of which I was one and, and everybody was running to get on the internet and you had the web designers come along because you don't even hardly see web designers anymore. Everybody just designed it for the web, pretty much. They're all UX people these days. And there are people who were doing web design and they're still doing web design and they don't do any UX at all. It's important to know that there are some web designers that have never done any UX work. Some of us did, many didn't. Some of the people today who are still considered to be web designers, they might do UX work, they might not. But at any rate, when the internet came along, You had people that began to focus on information architecture. People started doing some form of usability testing or what some people will call user testing. But it was in the late 90s when the dot-com bust, and it's important if you're going to do UX work, you need to understand the importance of the dot-com bust and what it meant to this discipline because it was people who began to embrace the importance of what we now know as user experience, then it was the focus on interaction design. It was the focus on usability. It was the focus on information architecture, the the taxonomies and the nomenclatures and setting strong information sense. It was important to know those things that, that optimizing those things was critical to optimizing the user experience. Again, I'm high leveling it. I'm trying to keep from getting too detailed about any of these things. UX practices, the forerunners, became the things that really helped to put UX on the radar and help companies understand we need to actually have people that are going to focus on this. We need to to start making sure that we're paying attention to this. We We need to make sure that we start doing research to ensure that we're doing things the right way, that we do the summative, the formative and the summative research to understand that we're doing the right things at the right time in the right ways. And this is when things started to become critical as it pertained to UX. Now, a lot of companies would depend on creative agencies. Most of the people who are doing the UX work, I'm I'm not going to say what we now know, I'm just going to say UX going forward. The people who were doing UX resided in the digital agencies the design agencies. And so companies were going to the agencies to get that help. But then eventually in the next, over the course of the next few years, companies like NASA and IBM started doing research that was being used to, to illustrate how critical being user centered was to design efforts. And they came to understand that for every dollar you invest in user centered design in UX could result in anywhere from 10 to a hundred dollars in a return on that investment. Now the corporation started getting wind of this ROI and ROI, that's their language. That's something that business people understood. And when they heard it, they started to get on the bandwagon now, but this bandwagon was sort of slow in, in coming. And so whereas starting in about 2000, 
you start to see more and more companies investing in UX. Then the research comes along somewhere around 2003 to 2007. So some, somewhere along in there, don't remember the exact year and the year is not all that important, but you start to see more and more of these positions coming about. Most at that time started to be more information architects. The acronym UX still was not being being used and being broadcast in a broad way. But all the way up until about 2010, 2011 or so, the vast, vast, vast majority of UX jobs resided in the creative agencies. And next thing you know, people started talking about how this field is up and coming. They started talking about this is going to be a great place of focus for those who are looking for new careers or who might be interested in doing this kind of work. Forbes and Forrester and all these, the Gartner group and all these people are doing all of these, these articles, these stories about this wonderful new career. And it was toward 2009, 2010, the end of that decade, that that acronym of UX started to become something that was more visible. It was start to become something that people were starting to use more. Nobody knew what UX was for the most part uh, beyond the creative agencies where the UX material levels were higher and the work was being done in a very methodical way and everybody was was in their own lane. And I should also mention as a part of UX history that there were no specialists. Everybody who did UX did everything. So every person was doing design and research and strategy back then. But as these articles started to, to be published, and as the talk about UX began to spread, the corporations, especially the corporations getting wind of the, the ROI associated with UX, a lot of them started to get on board. And these the job openings just began to just pop up everywhere. Everybody wanted to hire UX folks. And also, especially when you consider that in the corporations, they started to think, okay, well, we want our piece of this ROI pie. And we're going to get, we want this piece of our ROI pie. We also want to start hiring these people to be, to have seats in our organizations. We, we don't want to have to depend in the long term. We don't want to have to depend on the creative agencies for providing the service. Can't we just have this person sitting here in our organizations? Can't they have a seat? Not a seat at the table, not yet, but can't they just have a seat? And so as these positions started to arise, the volume of the positions started to arise, I should say, then, and the companies, the corporations and the startups started to, they wanted to hire these people and have them in-house, there was a huge boom. And so you've got all these open positions. You don't have enough qualified people to fill these roles. Now you have a, a, a problem, a, a new problem, a problem that we never had in the discipline. I should also mention that I talk about the, the, the high barrier of entry, that that high barrier of entry, I talked about that last week, existed all the way up until about 2011, 2012. Because as these, th this, this explosion in available positions and and not enough people to fill them, that's when the boot camps came into play. You hear about this great new discipline, you hear about all these job openings, you understand that there's not enough qualified people to fill these job openings, and we can't wait for four years. It didn't start really with nobody wants to go to get a degree for this. It was we don't have the time. Nobody has four years. These, these positions are available now. We need a way to, to generate and produce people who can fill these positions in a shorter amount of time. The, the dollar figure was something that comes along a, a, a tad later, but how can we get people ready to fill these roles faster? So the boot camps come along. So the boot camps come along, and this is also when the confusion or the fuzzy thing that, that I mentioned that I talked to somebody about earlier, the people were getting involved in UX. Companies were hiring for UX roles, but they didn't understand what UX was. They really didn't. 
a lot of them still don't to this day. Companies still don't. After that, that explosion, the gold rush, what we call the UX gold rush began for the, all these open roles. There were people who started lying about their qualifications to get the roles. And a lot of them started getting the manager and the director roles, which we're still suffering from to this day. I just realized, too, I'm only going to be able to cover one topic <laughs> this week. We'll, we'll pick up on, on Potpourri, the other three segments next time. I, I'm just going to stick with this history thing. I thought I was going to be quick with it, but I, I'm just not. I can't do it justice. So we'll just, we'll just deal with this today. But the, so you got a shortage of people to fill the roles. You've got these new resources coming up to help people fill the roles. You've got these corporations who are opening up more and more and posting for more and more of these UX jobs, but they don't understand what they're hiring for, who they're hiring to do what. They they don't understand anything. We are having, because of all these things, and oh, and also the barrier of entry starts to lower, and which is going to over time, detrimentally impact the quality of the work that's being done. So this is all really, really challenging, shocking, problematic, but this is what's going on with, with UX at the time. Now you fast forward, the 2011, 2012, you go forward a few years, you, you have the rise of what I call the poser, the rep, retrofit and the upstart. Some companies, they can't wait for people, qualify people to show up. They just start taking people in their companies and just start turning them into UX people. They give them the title, you know, figure it out as you go. Figure it till you make it. That's a lot of people started believing that. People started embracing that. And that's also when you start to see the downturn of where qualified people now, well, you know, I don't have to pay you this six figures. I can pay somebody else much, much, much less. And put them in this role because they didn't know what they were getting out of these people. What do you even expect out of these people? So you start to see the market start to get skewed. You start to see expectations getting skewed uh, where people did have any expectations. So UX has been for a while undergoing this. That's, I started at about that time, start telling people that the discipline was under siege. And I was told to shut up. I was told I was crazy for saying it. I was told that that's. That doesn't make any sense. Get out of here with that. But people didn't understand. They weren't paying attention to it. They'd never seen it before. I had. When I was in instructional design, I started seeing things like that take place. And and I actually left that discipline because of it. And I wasn't invested. So I could do that. I'm invested over here. So I'm not, I'm not going to do that over here. So UX really has undergone these very strange shifts very inhumane shifts, shifts that were not doing us uh, any favors, uh, doing us a gross disservice. You fast forward from about the 2013, 2014 range into from 2020 to 2024, and now you've got everything is upside down. You have, actually, back up for a moment, between 2014 and 2020, prior to that, you had the boot camps come along. Then you had what we call the MOOCs. And MOOCs is an acronym, M-O-O-C, that stands for Massive Open Online Courses. And they were delivering micro-learning. And you had the different little little courses like the Google course pop up, which was even something that was even had a lower barrier of entry and even a lower grade of educational quality, frankly, <laughs> that was being offered for a fraction of the cost of what the boot camps, we went from the what people were paying for degrees to what people were paying for boot camps to what people are paying for MOOC engagement. There even, there's even a free, today, a free UX research course available on edX. And edX is, a, is something that is a product of, of MIT and Harvard, for those that did, didn't know that. And so you could actually go and take a UX research course out there and, and, and tell people this information is out there for free. You don't even have to pay the boot camp. You don't have to pay Google. And some people think those things are a good start. Think about it. Who's saying they're a good start? People who don't know anything about it. For somebody that's been around for a bit, I'm telling you, that's not a good start. That's like telling somebody it's okay if you're just learning how to drive or you're just getting your first vehicle. It's okay if you have a, wheel, uh, if you have a vehicle that has square wheels. 
Um, that's that's the equivalent of those people telling you that that's a good start. I'm telling you that what they're saying that that's a good start is like driving a vehicle with square wheels. I don't think anybody wants to drive a vehicle with square wheels, even though you can get somewhere if you were on a vehicle with square wheels. Um, nobody wants to travel like that and nobody will travel like that, nor will you see a vehicle with square wheels on the road. So all types of things have happened to the degree that now hiring has been detrimentally impacted. Learning has been detrimentally impacted. The perception of the discipline has been detrimentally impacted. This is the, the history of UX. Again, very high level. I could get into a lot more detail. I'm not going to do that. Not today. I've done it at other times. Not today. This is a problem. And so when you have the people, oh, UX has only been important for the last 10 years. No, it hasn't. It's been long for more than that. And the people who do, because somebody told me that, but I know I've come across quite a few people who believe something of that sort. And they don't realize by not understanding what happened with UX between 1995 and 2010, and, and those people's perceptions are very skewed. They have different expectations. And now we've gotten to the point where people have, have made five years this pinnacle point of, of, of operation. They've, they've made it a milestone in UX. And a lot of people are hiring. And when they look for more senior people, they look for people who've been doing the work for at least five years. Five years is not a milestone. Five years is halfway through the mid-level point of one's development as a UX professional. It's Five years is nothing. So when you don't know history, you're, you're going to, or you run the risk of repeating errors. When you don't know the history, you won't have an appreciation for where the discipline has come from. When you don't know the history, you have a completely different set of expectations. You have a completely different set of expectations when it comes to how long it takes to mature in the discipline. Folks, if you want to thrive in UX, if you've never taken the time to learn about UX history, go back, read the books that were published from 1990 to 2010. Read those books. Listen to the perspectives that are being shared. That's going to help give you some, some history And add that to your foundation as a UX practitioner so you're not buying in on a lot of this UX celebritism that's circulating today, the the fast tracking of growth, which is not doable. You, You cannot grow in UX too fast and allow that to be something that's going to stick, something that's going to be substantive, something that's going to be solid. It's not a solid foundation. Nobody can become a senior in three years, but that's what people believe today. Nobody can, can, can become a lead in three years. You can't have one year of UX job history and be a director or a manager. That just doesn't compute. So we're hoping people, we're going we're gonna to end it here today. This is going to be a shorter episode for starting off our anniversary celebration. But folks, Please know and understand UX history. It is so important. You need to understand how long we've been around. You need to understand how we've grown. You need to understand how things have evolved. Don't be one of those people that say that UX has really changed a lot and it's really growing and changing. No, it actually hasn't. The the only thing that changes, if you knew the history, you would know that the only thing that changes in UX has to do with the form factors. We've gone from web pages and websites to mobile apps to mobile websites to adaptive to responsive to tablets to interactive tv to to augmented reality to virtual reality and and so there's just the form factors the principles the fundamentals have actually stayed the same and you just apply them to different form factors. The folks who knew the history know that, and they understand that UX is pervasive, and it's simply a matter of when you have a lot of people today that have Figma will travel, but it's really have fundamentals will travel. The tools are going to change. They're going to come and go. They've already 
change. They've already come and gone. And now we Figma is at the top of the heap today. And in five years, it's very likely to be something else. And, and there's a change every few years. Figma is not going to stay on that hill for a very long time. They keep trying to make themselves, trying to ensure that they're going to have relevance beyond X number of years. It hasn't happened yet. <laughs> no other tool. I mean, it's not like any of these tools are Photoshop. Photoshop's been around for a long time, but Figma's not Photoshop. And in the UX side of the house, there have been different tools that reign for three to five years, and then something else comes along and replaces them. It's likely going to happen again. So know the history of UX. If you really want to have a sound foundation, if you really want to have longevity in this discipline, despite what people are saying, and even though they're treat they're acting like the the zero to three years folks are the pinnacle producers they're not the people who think that they're the producers the main producers don't understand the history and don't understand the discipline and they're not going to have longevity either so make sure you understand history today of ux and you're going to be better off for it okay well, we're going to end it short today how about that so hope you enjoyed the show tell your friends let's help real valuable content to go viral and not just all this all this toxic positivity stuff and all the 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 cute and pretty stuff let let's let's share the stuff that really matters today and let's vault the discipline forward until next time this is darren hood signing off happy uxing everybody thanks for joining us for this session of cx of m radio be sure to rate review and subscribe to the show and visit cxofm.org for more resources.